werte Trauerfamilie, ladies and gentlemen, I feel truly honored to contribute to this event. And it is true, when I was planning this talk, I envisaged Kurt Komorek sitting there, remembering from the times when I applied for uh, Science Foundation money in Austria and he was signing the contracts I received when I was a postdoc in Innsbruck. The topic I selected today is something that is almost in everybody's mind. It's on the street, it's an ongoing debate, and I believe it's one of the most misleading debates we had seen in, on environmental issues over the last decades. What I'm going to do today is to convince you, just in the sense of Kurt Comrex, things are a bit more complicated than some people like them to be. I remember I was a young postdoc in Innsbruck and the Nobel laureate Manfred Eigen gave a talk in chemistry. And if I cite him correctly, one of his main ideas was life is essentially and inevitably tied to carbon by the very nature of that chemical element. And if there were life anywhere else in the universe, which supposedly is infinite, so the likelihood that life is in the universe is also infinite, it will be carbon-based. It will not be an aluminium world, it will not be a silicium world, it will be a carbon world. It all starts by some very basic functions, and I'm showing this, this slide well aware that you're not all biologists. These two functions are the basis of much of what we believe the carbon cycle that drives our own life does. That's the green curve that shows that the uptake of carbon by plants and ecosystems rises as you add light or carbon dioxide. And you may remember that we release carbon dioxide, so lots of hopes are tied to that green line that more carbon may cause any benefits to life on this planet. There is the other curve, the red one, that reflects some basic knowledge about physiology of animals, plants, and microbes, that you can accelerate chemical reactions, including respiration, by enhancing the temperature. So what I'm starting with is what we call an input function and an output function. And it's the interaction between the two that determines whether the carbon pool in the biosphere is rising or reduced. Now, as was mentioned already today, could Komarek was right in hesitating, seeing that issue being treated exclusively on the basis of carbon input and carbon output. But as we all know, there are other chemical elements essential for life, and they are usually per unit of land area finite. While these other elements, carbon and also nitrogen, are abundant in the atmosphere, and it only depends on the activity of organisms to pull them in. But theoretically, the availability is infinite. Let me now get you understanding that the vision I presented now with this input and output is very much limited. And I will start with something everybody understands. Let us build in New York or Rio de Janeiro or Vienna. Let us build houses and ask ourselves, what do we need to build a house? Well, you may say we need bricks. And bricks need to be produced somewhere. So we have a brick factory. We are delivering brick to the building site. And then the masons, provided there's enough beer, they will, and the holidays, etc., they will build. Now, who in this room would believe that the rate of building depends on the rate of delivery of brick. I guess nobody. Brick will be delivered to the building site on demand. And this is the perfect analogy to how we should understand plant growth, 
agricultural productivity and the productivity of the biosphere as a whole. We have a factory that is producing the building stones of life in photosynthesis. And these building stones are then invested in growth. But I believe everybody in this room, including myself, we grew up in believing that the rate of growth of that tree is driven by the rate of carbon uptake. You see the problem? That would be as if we assume that building depends on the rate of brick production. In reality, it is just the other way around. And what I'm trying to do tonight is to convince you of a shift in paradigm. We need to rewrite our school books, our textbooks, and we need to reshape our thinking about how plants grow, the most fundamental process for our life and for the uh, biosphere as a whole. So, I, I'm going to use these two terms, source and sink. The source stands for carbon uptake from the atmosphere and delivery to what we call sinks. These are the building sites where plants build cells and grow. The old philosophy, the one I grew up with, was that the source controls the rate of sink activity. And I hope I will be able to convince you that it is just the other way around, that the sink activity drives source activity on demand. Don't be afraid. I'm not going to explain that diagram, but I just want to give you a vision that source sink relationships that also drive our economy, including our own, is an extremely bis difficult business. You have a source box here, that is photosynthesis, but you have a very complicated sink box. That means export department, building department, maintenance costs, lots of things that require investments, and they all have their costs. So understanding sink activity is by far more complicated than understanding source activity. So what I'm trying to convince you is that the old model we all grew up with, that there is carbon uptake by photosynthesis, the business I grew up in my early postdoc years, is controlling the remaining uptake of resources. And so carbon supply has priority over growth. The new paradigm is these other resources determine how much carbon a plant can take up, and so meristem activity, production of new cells, controls uptake on demand. Like the masons on the building side, they call upon brick. We need more brick, we need to build. That's the picture you should have. It all started in Geneva some 120 years ago, following from chemical chemist work, the discovery of oxygen is tied to this by Ingenhaus, uh, and uh, mainly Theodore Saussure and Jean Senebier were these people who told an astounding society that plants eat air. You just imagine, until these people discovered that plants take up carbon dioxide, there was a deep belief that all what we eat, all what we dress for, all what the biosphere is, is taken up from soil. Now come these chemists and tell us 50% of your body is coming from the atmosphere. I mean, my hair, your shirt, what we ate over lunch, 50% of all organic material is carbon, and it's taken up from the atmosphere. I, I believe that fascination still keeps going in the modeling community of the year 2016. It's still that fascination. It's coming from the atmosphere. And what I believe is the reality is something different. I believe that the rate of tissue formation, that's the growth, is most commonly controlled by the rate of carbon assimilation, but that is driven by the most limiting resource, which commonly is not carbon. So if that is true, then the whole debate about carbon limitation and about carbon fertilization of the biosphere is nonsense. It's quite clear from that 
for carbon dioxide to cause a stimulation of plant growth, it needs other resources than carbon. So carbon must be a growth limiting resource to control growth. But if resources other than carbon are constraining growth, CO2 will be absorbed on demand. I will show you now three examples. Actually, I showed two of them for time reasons. And I will challenge classical ideas of how plants work when resources other than carbon come into play. That is water and that is thermal energy. This is a scientific diagram. And some of the audience may not be familiar with diagrams like this. But it's very simple. You see two lines. You see a green line and you see a red line. And no matter what the dimensions here mean, they just mean increasing water stress. So on the left end of these four diagrams, there's no water limitation. And on the right end, there's water limitation. And as you move from no limitation to some limitation, the rate of growth and the rate of photosynthesis change. But as you can see, as water stress creeps into the system, you see that growth, that means the formation of new cells, the building blocks of life, drops much earlier than does the uptake of CO2. So under all conditions tested so far until today, these are trees, sunflower, small herbs, crops, there's always the effect is first on tissue formation, on zinc activity, and last and much later on uptake by photosynthesis. This is a fundamental change in thinking. So when drought comes into play, the old system, the old concept that you have learned in school is leaves have little pores. We call them stomata. And these pores are closing because they are compromising between water loss and CO2 uptake. So when water is short, you close your pores at the price of reduced CO2 uptake. As a consequence, the plant will be hungry. And therefore, it grows slower. It, this is completely wrong. The correct picture is that the weaving stool of life, that is this fantastic machinery that produces cellulose, which is the most abundant chemical com compound on the planet, is silenced because it's a balance between growing the cell wall and internal pressure to expand the cell. And that delicate balance is heavily disturbed if water seeps in. So the sink activity collapses long before this happens. And as a consequence, you would expect if photosynthesis keeps going and carbohydrates are taken up, are produced, but they are not used for building, what's going to happen? The pool of non-structural carbon, that is sugars, starch, in some cases even lipids, should rise rather than be reduced as we learned in school. And this is exactly what happens. If you drought stress plants, the carbohydrates go up. And we learned in school, they go down. My second example is on low temperature. I spent much of my life trying to explain why trees cannot grow beyond a certain elevation in the mountains. Worldwide, from Patagonia to the Himalayas, I just returned from China on a project where we continue this sort of work. What is it? that causes trees not to grow beyond a line beyond which a multitude of species does very well. The answer is this diagram. And sometimes I tell my students, if I could make a tattoo in your brain, that would be a diagram for my tattoo. That's why it has a quotation mark. This diagram pulls together all our information on temperature dependency of source and sink activity. 
Now, source activity, that's photosynthesis, is the well-known bell-shaped curve. As it gets warmer, photosynthesis rises, and when it gets too hot, it declines, with a very broad optimum between 10 and almost 28, 27 degrees. And at zero degree, photosynthesis runs at 30% full speed. At five degree, photosynthesis runs at 70% of full power. If we then go to cell formation, to tissue growth, which is the other axis, either here mitotic index, which is related to cell division, or the cell doubling time, the time it takes for a cohort of cells to duplicate. So we start with 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. And for average, ever, each of these steps, it takes time. And when it's very warm, it takes only 10 hours to duplicate a cell cohort. If you go down to 10 degree, it takes already 60 hours. If you go to 5 degree, it takes in the order of 120, 130 hours to duplicate cells. And if you go to plus 2, it goes to infinity. So quite obviously, when it gets cold, there's no limitation of photosynthesis but there's the limitation of zinc activity. So again, you would expect if it's cold, carbohydrates should go up rather than be depleted. And this is exactly what we find in the field in all cold climates, including tree lime trees. So it's not carbon limitation, again, that causes the limitation of trees here. It's the activity of the meristems, those zones in the plant that produce new cells. We do not fully understand the final limitation, whether it's protein synthesis, whether it's ATP production from mitochondria, whether it's lignin synthesis, or whether it's the cellulose synthesis itself. It's a most fundamental limit below five degrees. Plants cannot grow. And this is true for winter crops. This is true for tree line trees. This is true for any cold adapted plant. So, the old paradigm says when it gets cold, photosynthesis becomes a limiting process. Sorry, this is wrong. When it gets cold, zinc activity limits the amount of carbon that can be meaningfully used for structural growth, and overshooting photosynthesis produces a rising of reserves. You know, physiology, which is the root of my own education, has a lot to do with chemistry, and I believe the beginning of the misleading philosophy that is still leading today all carbon models. There's not a single carbon model of the thousands that are, using, are used worldwide by thousands of researchers. They are all attracted by the beauty of the mathematics of these basic functions of photosynthesis. A CO2 saturation function, a light saturation function, and a temperature function. Give this to a mathematician. Give this to a modeler. That's great. We can model that. But we are dressing the horse from the tail. This is not the driver. These are driven. It's like if you drive a car, you're not going to drive it without an engine. So you need an engine. But it's not the engine that is going to drive you anywhere. It's a car with four wheels, steering wheel, and your desire to go somewhere, green and not red traffic lights. So you need the engine. But the engine is not the driver. The engine is a driven. So in order to test this, in reality, I'm now giving you a taste of the sort of research we actually need to test this at large scales. I'm showing you now a few pictures that illustrate an attempt at enriching the carbon dioxide atmosphere around field-grown trees. 110-year-old trees of this stature, in situ, in the forest. No fertilizer, no plowing, no disturbance. We just present the year 2080 to these trees in situ, in a forest. So we have a 50-meter tall research crane. And with the mean of that crane, we are exposing the canopy of the forest by releasing pure CO2 that we buy from industry. It's a waste gas that is cleaned on 
food quality, when you buy some groceries with some vacuum packing, there's always CO2 in it. So we became quite substantial competitors on the Swiss CO2 market, like all the, all the carbon, carbonated uh, drinks and all the packaging, they buy that stuff in lots. We bought every day two tons of food quality CO2 and released it via computer control in tall trees. And I'm showing you now just four slides to give you a feeling what researchers are doing that are trying to explore the question whether the biosphere and the forests are by far the most important component of the biosphere are carbon limited in the current world. We need to offer some proof that actually what we are doing, imposing a cloud of invisible carbon dioxide to tree cannabis, is actually reaching the trees in a windy environment 30 to 40 meters above the ground. And we were very fortunate. And I also was trying to show this to Kurt Komarek, because this is also an application of basic chemical knowledge. Many chemical elements have stable isotopes with one extra neutron in the nucleus. So if you have one extra neut uh, neutron, but the envelope of the element is the same, its chemical nature remains unchanged. And plants always discriminated, even when oil and coal and gas was produced millions of years ago, they always discriminated against carbon dioxide that contained the heavy carbon-13 isotope. It's like for the children, it's like if you have a big football and a small football. The big football is moving a little bit slower than the small football. So the likelihood that the normal light C12 CO2 enters the leaf is higher than the likelihood of the heavy C13C enters the leaf. And C13 in our body, in all of you, is about 1% of your carbon is C13. So we all have it in our body. It's totally harmless. It's stable. It has nothing to do with radioactivity. And we are now using this signal that came for nothing with the gas supplied from industry, and we check when this signal this is the measure of the signal seeping, is seeping into the tree over the years when we enriched with CO2. And you see these are trees, beech, oak, lime, and you see the signal seeps in, stays while we enrich, and after we finish the carbon dioxide enrichment, the signal returns. So we have proof that it actually reached the woody trunk of a tree. These are tree ring data taken from the core of these trees. And the carbon signal goes rapidly to mushrooms in the forest. All the mushrooms that we like to collect and eat, they are linked to plants, to trees in particular. And they are not taking up carbon dioxide. They are heterotrophic, as we call them. And so the autotrophic plant supplies sugar and in return gets nutrients. And within three months of switching on CO2, we see the signal is arriving in the mushrooms we collect in the forest. This is a side product of that work. We see how rapidly carbon is transferred to the mushrooms. We see no effect of productivity. You can measure productivity in many ways. One way is to collect all the debris, all the litter that falls down. Over the years, the black and the white bars never differed, so there was no change in carbon input through the litter fall. There was absolutely no effect on tree ring widths. So if you measure how the trees grew, you measure the tree rings before the experiment, during the experiment, and after it, there was no effect of tree growth. This is the central question, the, the great hope of people. You would never arrive at this answer if you start your modeling exercise by assuming that more photosynthesis causes more growth. Then inevitably you arrive at believing that more photosynthesis causes more growth. I mean, if you implement this in your model, this is what you get. We call these garbage in and garbage out. The problem is we don't have algorithms we don't have the mathematics and we don't have the mechanisms to parameterize models that they start with sync activity and run source activity 
on demand, largely driven by the new trend cycle. We here repeated the experiment in 110-year-old spruce. Spruce is the number one forest tree in, uh, tree in Europe. And you see again, these trees were enveloped with tubes that emit concentrated CO2 around those branches. Again, we had to prove that the signal went in. We show again the isotopes go into the tree, and then after the experiments, they get out. No difference in growth, whether you measure it at breast height, you measure it up there or in the canopy. There's simply no effect on tree growth. What the simple answer is, where should the nutrients come from that you need to build in more carbon in a plant? We see no indications that carbon is a growth-limiting resource for natural forests, and I could add many other experiments. We repeated these works in the mountains, in mountain grassland. But labeling forests with this carbon isotope issued a wonderful, we call it a bycatch, something you don't expect. This is the wonderful thing in science. Quite often, you plan things, and the real innovation comes unexpected. And this happened last month. When we published a paper in Science, for something nobody had ever thought could happen, we had this isotope signal seeping into spruce. And when we finished the experiments, my students were sorting the spruce roots that we found in the soil, and we had to separate them from other roots that belonged to other tree species. We don't do this experiment in a plantation. This is a natural forest with beech, oak, pine, larch, all sorts of trees growing around these spruces. And the isotope signal that we imposed on the CO2-enriched tree was the same in beech and pine and larch. How could that happen? I blamed the students. You did not sort the roots properly. And it's not easy to separate these fine roots. So I said to my then postdoc, Tamia Klein, Tamia, you have to take a pike, and you have to go to the field, and you have to open the ground, and you follow the roots from the tip to the tree. You have to simply know that root is coming from that tree, and that root is coming from that tree. And then you resample the fine roots again in the overlapping range. And he did, and the isotope signals were identical. What we found by accident is that trees, big trees in the forest, exchange huge amounts of carbon among each other through the hyphal network of fungi in the forest soil. That means we have lost individuality of trees in terms of their carbon relations. All our thinking was always, there's a tree, there's carbon uptake, there's growth, and then the tree dies, and that's it. And now we show these trees take up carbon, and there's trade, there's business going on back and forth in all directions, in tons of carbon per hectare per year. So science published this, part of CO2 research, but it's not actually CO2 research, it's just basic science. So trees, like most plants, are open systems, Carbon is traded among tall forest trees. This is questioning our concept of individuality with regard to carbon. There's one situation under which carbon is a limiting resource, and this is when light is short. When there's no light, of course, then you limit carbon uptake, and inevitably, you run the system into carbon limitation. And I just give you two or three examples what the fundamental consequence of that is. If you then go into shade systems and you look for lianas, and lianas, we, have, we don't have so many here in Austria, two, mainly two, heterohelix, ivy, and uh, clematis, die Waldrebe. But in the tropics, 50% of all the species in the tropical jungle are lianas. And these lianas are driving the carbon cycle, the longevity of the trees. Now, if these lianas in the deep shade of the forest, with half a percent of sunlight, take advantage of elevated CO2, and other than young tree seedlings who sit and wait 
for the gap to open. Try to go up, go up, go up, go up to make it to the top. Finally, to overtop the trees and take over ruling. If that happens, and we have evidence it does, for tropical and for temperate trees, we see enormous effects. The black bar is always high CO2, and the light bar is always low CO2. You need to remember, in deep shade, the absolute growth rate is very small. But the relative effect of adding CO2 is enormous. You never find such stimulations like plus 40, plus 60, plus 183, plus 44, plus 110, plus 250. You never find this in full light. If this happens, and lianas take selective advantage from that effect, which I believe is the case, then the net effect of CO2 enrichment is a systemic. That means you get one functional group of plants that has the strategy to climb to the top of trees, taking more advantage than trees. And then this is happen more regularly. That means the forest becomes more dynamic. And the more dynamic forest stores less carbon because you're favoring fast growing, low density trees, pioneer trees, not this slow growing heavy timber. So carbon dioxide can actually revert predictions from models that all predict the Amazonian jungle and the Congo Basin should take advantage from CO2 uptake by growing faster. If you include biodiversity, if you allow the system to be more complex, you actually end up with the opposite. You end up with a more dynamic forest that stores less carbon. Now, in summary, Elevated CO2 may enhance productivity only if nutrient supply permits. But if that happens, if, the, if there's more growth, remember, a more dynamic forest always stores less carbon. I believe elevated CO2 in the atmosphere is unlikely to cause a sustained increase of carbon storage. And I will use the last few minutes to make that point very clear. Uh, this is my third important slide. It's very simple. What it says is that the carbon cycle is driven by the nutrient cycle. And by nutrients, I mean molybdenum, manganese, potassium, phosphorus. I'm not talking about nitrogen. I'm just talking about a wealth of chemical elements, 22 of which are needed for any organism from bacteria to elephants to be healthy. If one of you had no selenium, you would not be sitting here. It's the element stoichiometry that controls life and it controls the ability of any organism to build in carbon. It's the nutrients that drive the carbon cycle and nobody is able mechanistically to model the nutrient cycle. But if you cannot model the nutrient cycle, the cycle, the availability of potassium, you will never arrive at the meaningful carbon uh, input in an ecosystem. We just take carbon because of these beautiful algorithms, these beautiful mathematics, and because people run around with these gas exchange equipments, as I did, and measure these things because they are easy to measure. I believe this part of science is a good reflection of how psychology influences science. You know, we measure what we have tools for, where we have instruments. And what we measure is important to us. Why? Because I guess because we are important to us. So we measure things we can measure, and we think they're important because we are important. I believe that whole last 20, 30 years research had been driven by the availability of tools and data and nice algorithms, a beautiful and perfect understanding of gas exchange biochemistry. But it had ignored those things where we have no tools. We have no stick that you can ramp in a stem that tells you the cell cycle runs at this and this speed. Or no stick to ramp in the ground to tell me, aha, the potassium cycle runs at that speed. We don't have these tools.
So since we have the tools to measure the carbon cycle, we believe in the carbon cycle as a self-sustaining machinery with a little bit of tuning by nutrients and water. But it's the other way around. It's nutrients and water that are tuning the carbon cycle. And that diagram, I believe, is the most important I would like every modeler to have in his plain brain as a tattoo. I will briefly mention only respiration. And it's the same, I could make the same presentation, I'm not going to do that, for respiration. Respiration is the big output of the biosphere. We respire because we're heterotrophic. All plants respire at night, all animals, all microbes respire and return carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. And we know that it's mitochondria, these wonderful energy machineries in all cells that do the job. And we learned in school, if it's warmer, respiration goes up. This is a nice Michaelis, Menten kinetic, people who have studied biochemistry know all that. And we believe temperature drives respiration. I am sorry, this is again wrong. No organism respires for fun. Respiration has to fulfill a demand. It has to fulfill a demand in terms of ATP, the currency by which we pay in the energy cycle. If there's a demand for ATP, respiration goes up. If everything goes easy because it's warmer, acclimation happens and the rate of the machinery tunes down. But in the end, you need a sink for the products, in that case, ATP. You need somebody who needs more energy. So if there's more growth, there will be more respiration. And I have a wonderful diagram that I really like. It's an old diagram. People have measured the annual litterfall in forests as a measure of productivity. And they related the annual litterfall to the annual carbon dioxide output of the forest soil. And believe it or not, the correlation is linear from Alaska to Amazonia. There is no temperature. You can predict by productivity how much a system will respire. And people today don't read Eugene Odum. In the 1960s and 70s, this was the time of Club of Rome when Yasef had its roots. They don't read Odum, and Odum already stated there must be an equilibrium in the long run between input and output. If there's none, you either deplete your system or you buy, build up a coal mine. I would love to have these ideas seeping into people who model carbon dioxide emission from the biosphere. I have not the time to expand on this, but we had several projects. I'm just showing the field equipment that we are using to measure the CO2 emission from forest soil. If you combine that with the total annual productivity, you end up with a beautiful one-to-one -one line. You can predict respiration by productivity. And it makes so much sense, because most of the respiration comes from microbes recycling debris in the forest soil. It's the amount of substrate that controls the amount of respiration. I always tell my students, you can eat your lunch only once. This is the annual input. You can eat it faster, if it's humid, a bit drier, then you eat it slower. But in the end, you have one lunch per year. You eat it, and then it's gone. Respiration is driven by productivity, and there's no way you can separate the two by using some funny temperature response curves that people take in the laboratory on some isolated tissue. Respiration is largely a function of net primary production. And net primary production is a result of soil quality, plant age, temperature, and respiration cannot be decoupled from net primary production. There is no independent temperature response over large areas and in the long run. So, Carbon sequestration is one of the most misunderstood and misused terms in the carbon debate. Carbon fluxes must be strictly, fluxes must be strictly separated from carbon pools. That is so simple. I gave a talk at MIT at the US. These engineers and economists understood immediately. If I give the same talk among biologists and ecologists, they don't understand the difference between fluxes and pools. It drives me crazy. I will give you one final diagram to make my point. So carbon sequestration means carbon stays and that's related to the mean residence time in an ecosystem. The faster the growth, 
The shorter is commonly the residence time. Just think of a plantation with poplars and eucalypts. They grow fast, but the storage is low. Think of an old growth forest. Grows slow, but the stock is high. In fact, productivity and storage are negatively correlated. I would love many of my dear colleagues to understand these very basic relationships between vigor, the rate of growth, and the amount of storage. And I make my point with this last diagram. Just allow us together make a very strange experiment. We imagine a tree or a forest, it doesn't matter, that has a 100-year lifespan. And we plant the tree, many trees in one parcel, and we allow these trees to grow. Every year, they grow by 1%. After 100 years, they reach a size where their eyes are fall and are dead, or we harvest them. What is the mean residence time of carbon in that system? What is the mean pool size? It's about here, 50. Now, we make the same plantation to grow twice as fast. We fertilize, or we do something funny. Just let's assume we can do that. So we allow these trees and this forest to cycle in 100 years twice tr through their life. We harvest them and do this again. So the productivity has doubled. What happened to the pool size? On average, over that landscape, no change at all. But what if we quadruple the growth rate and we don't wait for the saturation, which is a loss of investment. We want to have a lot of paper production, a lot of pulp, a lot of timber. We harvest whenever the system is at peak speed and we harvest four times in 100 years. The carbon pool size is dramatically reduced. So if I get one message across to you is, Faster growth should never be mistaken as being something that we may call carbon storage. We all know that. We all know that we never must confuse cash flow with capital. You know, if you do that, you're bankrupt. I don't know why we do this in the carbon cycle debate. People keep telling me, but this tree is growing. It's sequestering carbon. I said, no, there's one dying and harvested over there. You have to take all the trees over a large area over long periods of time. And the only way the landscape could store more carbon is to have more forests instead of cities and agricultural fields, you have forests. Or older forests, more older trees. It's the tree demography, like we have a human demography, age distribution, that is controlling the amount of carbon stored in the biosphere. No model that I know can model the mean residence time of carbon by accounting for age distribution of trees. The carbon flux, the input and the output is not going to tell you the story. I thank you very much for your attention. It was a long evening, and I hope I got some ideas across to you. Thank you very much.